Unit 2, Video 4, let's talk about the American Revolution. If you're into blood and guts and battle and war, this is not going to live up to those expectations. If you got bloodlust, there's plenty of American Revolution videos on YouTube where you can find out all the different wars and battles. I'm just going to go over the facts so I can get you ready for your AP U.S. history test. There's all the bad stuff. Obviously, the Americans have had a raw deal, shot her around the world, gets the, the fighting started. As we've already talked about, really, a lot of the things are on the side of the British if I were going to go over all the different pros and cons, which I guess I can real quickly, British drinks are richest nation in the world, strongest army and navy, most factories. They have all the colonies where they can get a bunch of resources, and they have actually even hired Haitians or their own Germans to fight. Their cons are they're fighting far away from home, they're unfamiliar with the land, soldiers don't really care whether they're going to win or not, and they're relying probably too much on the Haitians to do their fighting and not necessarily the trained British soldiers. The American pros are they're playing at home. They believed in the war and they had very strong leaders. That's not very many. What are the colony what are the cons? The colonies did not really get along. They weren't a United Nation. They didn't have any money. There's a whole bunch of them. So Again, you can go to socialstudiesgames.net or socialstudiesgames.us to get the details on those pros and cons and a bunch of other resources there. Common sense and the Declaration of Independence could be seen as persuasion or as war propaganda, if you want. Either way, they're two historical documents that have a lot of really good ideas that have influenced the history of mankind. So probably want to check those out. T. Payne and T. Jeff. All right, so what is the game plan for the American Revolution? George Washington, what are we going to do? The plan is going to be to cheat. Again, if you want details about all the specific battles in the war, tons of stuff on YouTube, tons of stuff online. I'm just going to give you the basics to get you ready for the AP U.S. History test. Odds are the U.S. History test is not going to say, what was the game plan? A, cheat. B, not cheat. C, play. Whatever. Anyway, guerrilla warfare. Um, we see this all the time now. Hit and run, uh, counter-strike, counter-terrorists, terrorists. Guerrilla warfare, here we're hit and run. This was not really uh, the preferred or the approved method of war. You usually line up and you fight a battle, and war was a gentleman's affair. Well, we got no chance winning a gentleman's war. If we play by the rules, if America plays by the rules, America's going to get destroyed. Got no chance. We line up head to head, we will get destroyed. The only way we can win this thing is cheat, cheat, and cheat some more. Guerrilla warfare, sneak up, hit and run, and then go run away shoot a couple dudes then run away and hide in the house the way that we see basically the way that uh, other countries or terrorists fight america today because we are the strong power imagine if the terrorists line up head to head with us they would be knocked out in minutes so the only way terrorists can fight hit and run sneaky stuff tricks and cheating and well guess what that's what we did to the british it was the only way that we could win was guerrilla warfare and so hide in the woods and sneak attacks that's what you got to do. If you are the underdog and you play by the rules, you're going to lose. Check out Malcolm Gladwell's book on underdogs, and he will go into great detail about that. I'm sure you can find something on YouTube as well. So we're going to cheat. We're going to use spies, and we're going to find out where the British are going to be, and we're going to know when to run and when to hide and where to be. And, yeah, we'll just basically do like the other patriots, the other New England patriots will do. No surprise that those guys are cheaters. All right, so let's get some of the conflict. Well, you know, we are the underdog. And when you're the underdog, you lose a lot. And we were losing a lot. And it isn't so much that, oh, man, we're losing the war. These dudes' lives are being lost. Their lives are being torn apart. For what? So, hey, maybe this was a stupid idea after all. So morale is pretty low, and a lot of the American colonists or the sunshine soldiers are saying, hey, you know what? Things were so bad under the British. Remember, we used to party all the time and hang out in the streets. Let's just go back to that. Who cares if they raise their taxes a little bit? Well, George Washington's like, no, we've gone this far. We're going to keep on going. And people are like, you're yeah, right, George, whatever. Well, so now he's got to get a way to fire his team up. And really, the only way to fire your team up is get a W. And so he's got to get a W. How's he going to get a W? He's going to cheat. It's all about cheating. We are a nation of cheaters. When people lie and cheat and steal from you, it's not a surprise. That is the birth of America. How does he cheat? Well, on... Well, and, and we see this often, like, and you know, like, oh, Washington crossing the Delaware, it's so heroic. It is amazing. It is a significant moment in our history, but it is also a significant moment where we cheated. 
Now, some people say, well, it's not really cheating, but it's definitely not playing by the rules. It's not following the rules of war up to that point. And people say, well, there are no rules in war. Well, yeah, there used to be rules in war, and there still are rules of engagement. There are rules that we're supposed to follow and that most people follow. But then again, if you're an underdog, you don't follow the rules. If you follow the rules, you're going to lose. So Washington crosses the Delaware here, the Delaware River here. So we're in New Jersey. We're going to cross the Delaware and we're going to sneak up and surprise attack the British regulars and mainly the Haitians in Trenton. And they sneak up and it's a surprise attack and we win and the British have to retreat. And you're like, well, it's a surprise attack. It's not really, I'm um, not playing by the way. It's on Christmas. This is Christmas Eve. Like There are days where you don't fight. There are religiously observed holidays where like, look, could we put the guns down for one day? This is a day where people say, let's put the guns away. Let's be better human beings. Like, all right, we agree. Today we're not going to kill each other. All right, good deal. And as soon as we make the deal, we cross the, the, the and try to kill him. So, hey, maybe it's not as bad, but it's definitely not um, being honest and being gentleman. And I'm sure people are saying, who cares about being gentlemen? All right, I get it. But understand that underlying theme of, hey, you got to cheat a little bit. All right, so this one's not necessarily cheating. One of the British plans here is the Battle of Saratoga. And the British have a plan of like, look, let's get this thing over with here. It's really easy. We're going to fight this war in the state of New York, and we're going to separate the colonies. We're going to separate New England from the mid-colonies and from the South. If we divide the Americans, then they will be smaller. But also, if we divide the Americans, not only are their armies smaller and disconnected, really the people we got to worry about are those people up in New England. They're the crazies, the people in the mid-colonies, the, the colonists in the South. They're really not too far separated from us. We can convince them in the war. We just got to separate the lunatics from the rest of them. We can do that, the British say, through winning the Battle of Saratoga. Well, we actually, you know, through our guerrilla warfare and our tricks, are able to win this. They do not divide the colonies. And really, at that point, it's like, all right, all right we see what you're doing. And so the war is on. Another part of the war, or another significant part of this war, and then every war is allies or our allies. An enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy of my enemy, which France and Spain hate England. They hate the United Kingdom. So they are enemies. So the enemy of England. Anyone that's an enemy of England is a friend of France, is a friend of Spain. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Just like we hate England, so anyone else that hates England they're on our side. So France, they want the English to lose power. The Spanish want the English to be weaker. They want to weaken their enemy. And the best way to weaken your enemy is to help your enemy's enemy. And so they help us, thinking that we're going to smash them up. And if we beat up the English enough, then maybe they can then jump in if they need to. And they're not going to do that. But think about it. Anyway, so what they'll do is they'll help us out with that Navy that we needed, giving us ships and providing us resources, and then also give us money. And with that money and the Navy, then, hey, we're back in the game. We got a chance here. We were almost down and out. Everybody was going to quit. We won a couple battles. Now we got some resources. Hey, maybe we're not as tough as the British, but we're still in this game. We still got a chance. We got to keep fighting. And so now hope is back alive. And then it kind of drops down again here during uh, the winter in Valley Forge where people are dying. People are catching smallpox. It's not very good. It's like, all right, we're going to win. We're going to lose again. But th that's kind of the way it goes. You know, it's a, it's a long season. There's ups and downs. There's many different moments in a battle or in a game. So this is a downtime. But America, under the guidance of great leaders like George Washington, they pull through. Another great leader, John Paul Jones, kind of represents the spirit of Americans that we never give up. We never quit. We never surrender. We are winners. We win them all. We, well, technically, we didn't win every war. Well, we've won almost every war. John Paul Jones is famously, his, his line is, uh, you know, he, he's getting beat up. Then the, his Navy, his ship is getting blown up by the British over and over and over. And the British are like, dude, are you ready to quit? And he said, this is after three hours of pow, 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 pow. And basically, John Paul, not basically, why do I keep saying basically? John Paul just says, look, I have not yet begun to fight. I ain't even started. Like, this dude is a lunatic. And to prove he's a lunatic, he drives his ship into their ship and smashes the ships together and they fight. And he technically wins, even though. And so it's a win in the history books and it's a win for morale. And we're like, yeah, we beat them. They had to quit. We made them quit. 
They officially quit. Yeah, but your ship got destroyed. It sank. You lost a bunch of lives. Is it really a win? Well, they said they quit, so that's a win, and it counts. Especially though, you're like, that's crazy. This is nonsense. But it doesn't when it's really just all about morale and making sure that keep, people keep fighting, keep fighting, and don't quit. It's all just about telling yourself you're winning because you're really not counting the bodies. When you're looking at wars, often the American people are like, oh, we don't count. We lost another. We lost another. It's all about morale, spirit. I have not yet begun to fight. And the downside, you've got Benedict Arnold, who was a famous trader. What's the theme here? Americans are greedy and ambitious. Is that a bad thing? I don't know. Uh, if we look at the battles and break them down, again, I'm not going to do that. Calm your bloodlust. There's plenty of other videos where you can see people get shot. This is not one of them. We're just trying to get the basic facts so that you're ready for the AP test, but more so that I can move on to the next unit. I can't just talk about the things I think are important in unit two and then skip the war and like, oh, wait, how did the name, what happened with that war, Mr. Dietrich? You know, we were talking about the documents and all these ideas and all the turmoil, and then you just skip the battles and all of a sudden we've got a nation. So I've got to do a video where I talk about how the battles go down although I don't think they're that significant. Anyway, the British win most of them. The British, I think Jeff, I think Washington's record is something like 3-13. and 3-13! <laughs> he won 3, lost 13. How did we win the war again? Well, we'll get to that right now. Uh, we're gonna, we'll focus on uh, our local area here, Battle of Guilford County Courthouse. The British technically win this battle, but they suffer significant significant losses and so the plan is for the british here in north carolina is after this battle they technically win but they need to move back i guess you could call it retreating even though not necessarily retreating but regrouping would be a better term they're going to regroup get the resources get their people back and meet up with their other uh, troops so they have to move back up into virginia so at the very least the americans may not have won this battle but they have redirected the british back to virginia and back towards the coast which is what the americans wanted to do so technically from that perspective it was a strategic win it suffered a lot of casualties um, so the british have to march to yorktown to regroup here is yorktown over here is guilford county and so we're pushing them back over towards yorktown to regroup so it's significant in that, but it's like Battle of Guilford Courthouse, probably not going to be on your AP U.S. History's test, but there are other significant battles. But in the end, we're talking about getting pushed back to the Battle of Yorktown. And so when they get pushed back here, the main British military all of a sudden finds itself trapped and surrounded in Yorktown. Talk about a ridiculous military blunder, a strategic error. You don't want to allow your major army to get surrounded. All you got to do, British, is just one thing. Make sure you don't get your main army surrender or surrounded and you're going to be fine. There's just one little mistake that you could make that's going to cause you to lose the war. And they made that one mistake. They are surrounded. The main army for the British under Cornwallis is forced to surrender. So imagine like you know, your team is up by 30 points and it's the fourth quarter or your team's up by six runs. It's the eighth inning and you go to bed. This game is over. You wake up in the morning, you turn on the TV or you get in and you're like, we lost. How did we lose? We were up by 30 points. What happened? That is the American Revolution. The British are destroying us. They're killing us. They've got the best team. This game is over. You went to bed, and then you found out that, like, wait, what did you do? It's kind of like when the Patriots beat the Falcons. Falcons were destroying them at half. Like, oh, this game is over. And then you wake up the next day. Like, wait, what? How did they lose? That is the British. They just made a big mistake, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, it's over. That's it. They had to surrender, and all of a sudden, America is a nation, and the British are gone, sort of, kind of. We're going to get back to that later. It's really just about winning the, the important ones, and the Battle of Yorktown is that big one, and we won the big one. We lost all the other ones, but we won that big one. And so the Treaty of Paris 1783 will establish the United States of America. And so all this land in the purple belongs to us. So there's the 13 colonies, but we're going to get the Northwest area, which today we call the Midwest. And then the Southern states, it's all ours. It's all ours. Yay. What about the American Indians? Well, we'll talk about that in the next video. So the Northwest Ordinance will be the last thing that we talk about in this unit. And this will be the Northwest. It was the Northwest then. It is the North. It is the West back in 1783. Today, we call this the Midwest because the mid of our country. It's not really the West anymore. So why, shouldn't we just call it the mid? I don't know. 
Uh, and then it will be these states right here, which we'll show in a little bit more detail. And we established some rules because remember, we've been since that proclamation of 1763, people have been dying to go west. We gotta go west. We gotta go west. I want to use that land. All right, all right, all right, You can go let west. The one of the first issues of our country, the first laws will be the Northwest Ordinance. And our early colonial government will say, all right, cool. This is America too, but we gotta put some rules here. If you're going to go over there, you need to have 60,000 people, then you can start your own state, And but you also must establish schools. And if you look through this area today, there are a lot of public universities. There's a strong dedication to education because the main rule for setting up the Northwest or today's Midwest, the main backbone or belief or idea for these states in this area was education. It is still a very important part of that part of the country. They have a, a belief in education because they had to. They were forced to. And so you can see the states, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, they will be established between 1785, 1787. That's when the law was passed. Like, But it takes a while to get 60,000 people in schools set up before they become official states. There it is. Unit two is done. I will see you again in unit three. There's other war videos out there.